Hello, Bible readers. Today we look at Genesis 14 and 15. Brueggemann says uh, the chapter 14 is the most enigmatic chapter in Genesis. It seems to stand utterly alone and without connection to the rest of the book. And so it does speak to this Melchizedek character who's very mysterious. Um, the most that Brueggemann has to say about anything is about how God Most High is a title that would have been borrowed from the Canaanite religions and is a good example of how um, some cultures will come in and appropriate titles and kind of redefine them. Um, so that could be an interesting word study or phrase study, whatever you'd want to say, but I, I mostly want to get to chapter 15 today because theologically this is probably the most important chapter in the whole Abraham narrative that started in chapter 12 and will continue another six chapters. Paul will use uh, this chapter 15 and its understanding of faith to consider justification by faith. That is how faith becomes central to humanity being put right with God. That's what justification is, being put right with. Uh, the themes in chapter 15 are faith in the first seven verses, which is pretty much all I'm going to talk about. And then there is the theme of covenant in the last 14, which we talked about previously. Here's how Brueggemann talks about uh, faith based, based on fifth, chapter 15. This is actually going to take a little bit. It's worth offering your fullest focus. Um, it is thick, what I'm about to offer, but it is profound, like really profound. So Abraham and Sarah were called out of their barrenness by God's powerful word. We've talked about that. But when we arrive in chapter 15, you might notice the barrenness persists. That's the issue. He says, Brueggemann says, it's part of the destiny of our common faith that those who believe the promise and hope against barrenness still must live with the barrenness. That can be hard, right? Why and how does one continue to trust solely in the promise when the evidence against the promise is all around? It is this scandal that is faced in chapter 15. It is Abraham's embrace of this scandal that makes Abraham the father of faith. So in verse 1, Abram has clearly concluded that the call from barrenness was a false alarm. But then God reestablishes the promise. God says, don't be afraid. Your reward shall be very great. And this word reward is worth some time. The way this Hebrew word gets used, it implies uh, a usage that's more like gift than quid pro quo, which you might know as this for that. Here, reward is not a prize that is earned, but a special recognition given to a faithful servant of a king, and that servant has performed a bold or risky service. Abraham and Sarah are called to bold and risky things, and that is to live their lives against barrenness. The reward calls them to live as creatures of hope in the midst of a hopeless situation. And then Brueggemann admits, the theme of reward poses one of our most difficult issues in interpretation because it can't be that our trust is what triggers God's promise keeping. That would mean God's actions depend on us, which would make us a God over God, right? We already know God is God, not us. God will do what God wills. God doesn't have to wait on us and whether or not we choose to trust but on the other hand, it is clear that those who hope will be given the gift. Brueggemann says, this does not make a very logical argument. <laughs> right. But it is a key insight of biblical faith. The gift of God is given especially to those who trust and who will risk according to what is promised. We see this all the time in the New Testament with Jesus, where people come to Jesus for a healing and he says, your faith is has made you well. That's, that's a reward given to someone living in the promise. It's hard to say which comes first. Is it a quid pro quo or not? But Brueggemann has more to say that I think clarifies it. He, he goes on to say, it is hazardous to speak of rewards as these texts do, for they may be heard as bargains or bribes, and yet 
there it is. Faithful trust does make a difference. God does respond in generosity to those who trust. It will not do, though, either to be silent on the question or to leave this subject to religious hucksters who promise all kinds of benefits in religious retailing. Uh, the prosperity gospel would be an example of religious retailing. Rather, Brueggemann says, the rewards must be articulated simply as the generous response of God to those who heed God's call and share in God's life. Okay, so let me be more clear about this difficult idea about rewards and how God's generosity and our faith work, what the relationship is. In verses 2 and 3, Abraham protests to God twice. There's nothing in God's promises that Abraham can find persuasive. God doesn't offer any, any persuasive arguments. When God reasserts the promise, God doesn't offer any explanation or a foolproof argument. Instead, God offers, after reasserting the promise, a revelation. Look up and count the stars, he says. This is a sign that proves nothing. <laughs> but it's a sign, it's a revelation that places Abram and his imagination in the proper space, in proper perspective. We struggle, just like Abraham did, to feel certain about a God who is not based on human reason or anything that can be argued to the point of proof. But this revelation to Abram taps into a primal awareness that God is God. An attitude of certainty comes over Abraham, despite the barrenness that continues in his life. None of that has changed. But it's here, in this revelation, that Abram comes to know. And the knowing can only be credited to the patient work of God. Only this new awareness that God really is God provides the ground for Abraham's faithful future. By verse 6, it says, and he believed the Lord. Abraham has repented. He's abandoned a reading of reality, which is measured by what he can see and touch and can control. Abraham's faith sees that the future will be given. Not earned, not achieved. It will be given. It will be new. It will not be derived from the present barrenness that he lives in. Abraham believes in a genuine Genesis to come. That is faith. And then, I know I've gone long, but like I said, this chapter 15 is worth it. Hear this idea about the moment when he looks up at the stars. The multitude of stars is received by Abraham as a sign of the power of God in his life. The sign is not proof of anything, but it is a sacrament to those who can discern the connection between the concrete visible and the promise. That's a great definition of a sacrament. You know, pouring water three times on someone's head, eating bread and wine after saying words of institution, these are never meant to be proof points or even persuasive. God uses sacraments, like God uses this moment when Abram looks up at the stars to create space for a creature to recognize that he or she is indeed a creature, a created one, living in God's world on God's terms. In Abram's case, those terms are grace, ours too. The faith of Abraham should not be understood as an achievement by Abraham or a moral decision that Abraham makes in order to get a reward. Instead, God reveals God's self to Abraham in chapter 15, and Abram has eyes to see and ears to hear. That God is God, that Abram is creature, and he's a creature of this promise. Receiving this revelation is how faith is born. This is a revolutionary moment in the history of faith. Faith comes to mean here to trust God's future, to live a, assured of that future, even amidst a deathly, barren present. No other Old Testament text has more influence on the New Testament than chapter 15's understanding of faith. Because Paul's going to use this understanding of faith, and Luther and you and I, we live into this understanding that faith is a way of seeing and hearing and being. 
a way that is graced to us. Tomorrow we're going to look at chapter 16 through 18, verse 15. We're going to hear the laughter of Sarah. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.